Welcome to a comprehensive exploration of Section 10 of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, a beacon of hope for corporates in financial turmoil. This segment of the code isn't just a procedural formality, it's a transformative mechanism for companies to navigate through the choppy waters of insolvency. Let's peel through Section 10. Corporate debtors can trigger insolvency resolution by acknowledging their inability to pay. What's a corporate debtor? Defaulting companies or LLCs owe money. The foundation of Section 10 is default, a legal failure to repay matured debts. To prevent frivolous insolvency and ensure serious financial rehabilitation, the code sets a minimum default amount. Who can embody the corporate applicant? The term includes directors, partners, and anyone else who can influence the company's finances. Application is a strategic compilation of key financial documents, proof of default, and majority shareholder or partner resolutions. The company's financial distress and plea for resolution are in this affidavit. NCLT or DRT adjudicating authorities don't have forever to consider applications. Admission begins the IRP, while rejection is an opportunity to revise and resubmit. They have 14 days to assess, verify, and decide on the application. After application acceptance, the interim resolution professional takes over the corporate debtor, setting the stage for a financial resurrection or orderly dissolution. Judgments and amendments that address economic changes and insolvency proceedings refine Section 10. These court rulings have set precedents for future applications and interpretations of this legal provision. Section 10 of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code protects viable businesses and mitigates financial failure through a complex, well-thought-out process. Corporate insolvency requires proactive planning, meticulous preparation, and legal foresight. Decoding Corporate Insolvency Let's navigate the intricate landscape of corporate insolvency by dissecting its core. Insolvency, in the corporate realm, is a condition where a business cannot discharge its debts as they mature. To bring clarity to this abstract concept, consider the detailed scenario of Futura Tech Mobiles. Pioneering smartphone company Futura Tech Mobiles faced many challenges. They had unsold inventory and dwindling cash reserves due to aggressive expansion and a market shift towards cheaper technology. They were near insolvency despite restructuring efforts to pay their debts. Insolvency is the result of strategic, operational, and financial mistakes and vicious market dynamics. For Futura Tech, insolvency required a formal legal process to acknowledge their inability to pay creditors, activating legal mechanisms. The cost of insolvency is measured in more than just money. The financial instability of cost-cutting measures often falls on employees. Suppliers and lenders now face the possibility of significant losses, which could threaten their financial health. Multifaceted economic fallout. Corporate insolvencies can cause sectoral downturns and lower investor confidence and consumer spending. The insolvency of a single prominent firm can raise peer borrowing costs by 2% due to elevated risk perception, according to empirical studies. Take the 2008 collapse of Lehman Brothers as an example. Its bankruptcy caused severe financial market disruptions, highlighting the systemic risk a single entity's insolvency can pose. Legal consequences of insolvency include corporate dissolution, asset liquidation, and director prosecution for insolvent trading. The legal process distributes remaining assets to creditors, but they often only receive a portion. Indeed, corporate insolvency is a complicated legal and economic process. Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code provides a structured approach to revive or wind up a corporate entity. Understanding corporate insolvency is crucial as we conclude this segment. It encourages informed decision-making and emphasizes good financial practices and corporate governance. Zooming in on Section 10. Section 10 of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code empowers corporate debtors to address their financial distress. This section is a legal tool that allows struggling companies to start an insolvency process. Consider a corporate debtor a critical patient. Patients consent to Section 10 in hopes of recovery rather than death. This structured approach recognizes that while the company's liabilities have outweighed its assets, a systematic, law-guided intervention may save what's left. Corporate debtors must first default to qualify for this process. In this context, default refers to any financial obligation the company has not met, including bank loans, supplier credit, and other due payments. The corporate applicant, who is it? The corporate debtor or a board of directors, key managerial personnel, or designated partner in an LLP could take such a decisive step. The shareholders or partners must pass a resolution to authorize them to represent the company. This application is like a financial crisis dossier for the company. It includes detailed books of account and documents that show the company's financial history. Its elaborate story reveals the company's financial situation. As a judge overseeing a trial, the adjudicating authority can decide this application. 
Their role is administrative and quasi-judicial, ensuring that the application is complete and supported by facts. They must decide within 14 days, emphasizing financial distress. The company enters a moratorium on legal actions and debt recoveries upon admission. This gives the company and the interim resolution professional, a specialist hired to guide it through the resolution process, time to plan for recovery or liquidation, whichever maximizes economic value. When we look at Section 10, we see that it's not just a procedure but a lifeline for businesses. It represents the code's emphasis on reorganization and compromise over liquidation to resolve financial distress. Eligibility criteria explained. Not all corporate debtors qualify for Section 10 insolvency proceedings. The gatekeeper is, default. Let's unpack this term with the precision of a legal expert. A corporate debtor defaults when a debt is unpaid. It's a legal failure that shows the debtor can't pay. Default requires incontrovertible evidence, such as correspondence showing unpaid invoices, legal notices from creditors, and bank statements showing missed payments. Paper evidence proves the debtor's financial woes. The default threshold is an intentional number to filter out frivolous claims. This threshold is based on significant indebtedness, preventing minor defaults from clogging the insolvency process. Why is a threshold set? Intended to preserve the insolvency process. With a minimum limit, the law only alerts the adjudicating authority to serious financial failures. This prevents trivialization of the insolvency process, reduces frivolous or opportunistic filings, and allocates the adjudicating authority's time and resources to serious economic cases. The threshold also protects economic strategy, prevents premature insolvency proceedings that could disrupt a business's operations over temporary financial issues. It is designed to balance creditors' repayment interests with business viability, job protection, and market stability. With inflation, economic conditions, and policy goals, the threshold may be adjusted. This adapts the insolvency resolution framework to the broader economic environment, providing a safety net for distressed businesses while maintaining rigorous entry standards. Corporate debtors considering Section 10 must understand the default threshold concept. Besides being a financial limit, it's a policy tool that balances economic pragmatism and financial discipline. Filing the application, a step-by-step -step guide. Each step of filing a Section 10 application is crucial and complicated. Move carefully through this process. Step 1. Document Prep. This is about telling the company's financial story, not just collecting financial statements. The documents must be accurate, complete, and cover the code's default period. These papers are the company's insolvency petition's evidence. Step 2. Proving Default. The application's foundation is default. Demand letters, judicial or arbitration orders, and dishonored checks or failed transactions must prove it. The adjudicating authority must see financial distress in this evidence. Step 3. Board, Partner Resolution. This resolution formalizes intent. It must be carefully drafted to reflect the corporate entity's leadership's consent and commitment to insolvency. The resolution is binding and sets the stage for the proceedings. Step 4. Interim Resolution Professional Nomination. This expert guides through insolvency. They must be qualified, experienced, and impartial. Professionals must give written consent to the nomination, confirming their readiness and eligibility to act under the code. Step 5. Complete Form 6. This form transports the corporate debtor's request to the adjudicating authority. From the corporate debtor's information to the default severity and resolution plan, Form 6 requires attention. A thorough and clear form is needed. Step 6. Application Fee. The insolvency resolution fee is a financial commitment, not just a payment. According to IBC rules, the amount must be paid by the specified method and proof of payment must be attached to the application. Step 7. Filing. Filing is the culmination of preparation and precision, not just submission. The application must be submitted in person, by mail, or electronically per NCLT rules. Each document is checked for code compliance after filing. Step 8. Acknowledgement. The application's legal entry is sealed by this acknowledgement. It verifies that the corporate debtor has started the insolvency resolution process and starts the adjudicating authority's statutory timeline. Each of these steps shows Section 10's rigor and diligence. This application is a crucial step towards revival or resolution for the corporate debtor. The adjudicating authority's role and review process. The adjudicating authority's role in insolvency resolution is crucial and multifaceted. Let's peel back this role to understand the authority's actions after receiving a Section 10 application. After receiving an application, the authority must conduct a thorough review that requires careful analysis and legal detail. This is a thorough check on the documentation's completeness and compliance. Each day of the 14-day review is crucial. 
the authority must verify that the application is filled correctly, with every annexure, exhibit, and affidavit in place and no procedural error that could invalidate the debtor's plea, within this time frame. A, complete, application must show procedural compliance and substantive proof to the authority. The default claim, the board's resolution to initiate proceedings, and the nominated resolution professional's eligibility and consent are assessed. When an application fails to meet standards, the authority issues a defect notice. This directive could lead to dismissal, not just a suggestion. With only seven days to correct the errors, the applicant must act quickly. In deciding the application, the authority is not alone. It considers how its decision will affect creditors, stakeholders, and the corporate debtor's future. Accepting or rejecting the application affects the company and the economy. The authority must ensure that the proposed resolution professional has no disciplinary proceedings before admitting the application, emphasizing the importance of integrity and capability in insolvency management. Rejecting an application indicates procedural or substantive issues. This rejection allows the applicant to revise and resubmit or appeal, protecting their due process rights. Thus, the adjudicating authority protects the insolvency process by balancing legal scrutiny with fairness for all parties. It adjudicates and protects the resolution process within the law. Post-admission steps, the commencement of CIRP. The acknowledgement of an application's admission by the adjudicating authority marks a watershed moment for the corporate debtor. This juncture is not merely procedural, it is the inflection point where the entity's control, operations, and future prospects pivot dramatically. The corporate debtor is protected by a statutory moratorium immediately. This legally binding moratorium halts creditors' claims and prevents company asset fragmentation. It temporarily protects the corporation from litigation and enforcement. The interim resolution professional, IRP, appointment is strategic, not managerial. In the cockpit of the corporate debtor, the impartial IRP must immediately assess the company's financial health and protect its operations. To maintain stability and prepare for the committee of creditors, they must act quickly. The IRP must update and verify claims on a list of creditors within days, akin to a precise liability census. Their role includes identifying and fixing operational hemorrhages to preserve the company's value during the CIRP. A special resolution from shareholders or partners shows democratic consent, not just procedure. It signals a collective decision to resolve insolvency strategically rather than by force. The consent gives the IRP democratic legitimacy to proceed. The CIRP's strict timelines reflect the urgency and criticality of efficiently resolving insolvency. Days are counted, actions are timed, and decisions are crucial. After formation, the COC must resolve conflicting interests and complex negotiations. This financial and strategic plan, carefully crafted by the IRP with input from the COC, could revive the corporate debtor. It considers business restructuring, asset realignment, and sometimes difficult operational cuts or layoffs to recover from financial distress. The CIRP involves intense scrutiny and strategic deliberation of all stakeholders' interests. It shows the code's strength, providing a fair, transparent, and equitable financial resurrection or orderly closure process. Therefore, the CIRP is not just a procedural formality but a comprehensive legal mechanism designed to preserve economic value, restore corporate health, or facilitate dignified exit, all of which are crucial to financial system and economic integrity. Rejection and Rectification – Understanding the Provisions the adjudicating authority's rejection of an application in corporate insolvency is more than a procedural hurdle, it is a major setback. Rejection can occur for many reasons, reflecting the insolvency framework's strict standards. Let's dissect these reasons. They could be minor clerical errors like a missing date or an unsigned affidavit or major legal issues like failing to prove a default or getting the company's director's or partner's consent. Potential conflicts of interest or insufficient resolution professional qualifications are other grounds. The seven-day rectification window requires prompt and precise corrections by law. In this focused period, the corporate debtor must cross-check their application against the authority's feedback and consult with legal and financial advisors to ensure a flawless resubmission. This rectification period is based on procedural fairness and gives applicants a structured but flexible opportunity to fix defects without prolonging the insolvency process. At this crucial point, quick action and meticulous detail are needed. A precise procedural dance is needed for the corporate debtor's response to the rectification notice. Each corrected page, revised exhibit, and supplementary document must meet authority requirements. It requires forensic analysis of the original flaws and strategic correction. The authority re-evaluates the application if the corporate debtor rectifies. 
This is a nuanced reassessment of the rectified application's integrity and completeness in light of the insolvency code's strict requirements. If the corporate debtor fails to respond within this critical window, the application will be dismissed. The insolvency code's appellate path emphasizes the justice system's commitment to due process and the debtor's right to a fair trial of their insolvency plea. To navigate insolvency, one must understand rejection and rectification. It shows the code's delicate balance between strict standards and fair course correction, which preserves the insolvency resolution process. Case Law Analysis, Judgments that Shape Section 10 Let's explore the pivotal cases sculpting the landscape of corporate insolvency under Section 10. In Unigreen Global Private Limited vs Punjab National Bank, the court denied the application for insolvency resolution due to non-disclosure of all financial facts. This case stands as a testament to the principle that only transparent dealings pave the way for insolvency resolution. The Export-Import Bank of India vs Astonfield Solar case was a game-changer for shareholder democracy in insolvency proceedings. The court held that shareholders' approval cannot be bypassed, ensuring they have a decisive voice in the initiation of insolvency. In the dismissal of NISA Infrastructure Limited's petition, the court reminded us of the gravity of authority. The director's disqualification under the Companies Act questioned the legitimacy of the insolvency plea, underscoring the need for bona fide representation. The Go First Airline case is unprecedented. It showcases how voluntary insolvency can serve as a strategic recourse for ailing companies. The NCLT's acceptance of Go First plea illustrates a nuanced understanding of corporate distress and a willingness to allow businesses a chance for rebirth. Each judgment unveils a layer of the intricate corporate insolvency ecosystem, from the importance of full disclosure and authoritative integrity to the empowerment of stakeholders. Through these cases, the judiciary not only interprets the law but actively molds it, offering clarity and direction for future corporate insolvency proceedings. Practical Tips for Corporate Debtors Section 10 Applications Require Careful Planning Here's a detailed guide for corporate debtors. Record all assets and liabilities. Code scrutinize your finances, any omission can dismiss an application. Early shareholder or partner engagement. Their consent is legally binding and reflects collective business judgment. Selecting an interim resolution professional requires strategy. Their expertise and reputation will affect your insolvency. Think ahead about the moratorium. Use this time to reorganize, not to avoid debt. Finally, anticipate operational issues. Prepare for the resolution process's rigors, from essential services to workforce morale. This detailed strategy helps corporate debtors strengthen their application and navigate insolvency with clarity. Conclusion As we conclude our in-depth exploration of Section 10, let's consolidate our understanding of this pivotal provision within the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. We dove into the eligibility criteria, highlighting the need for a demonstrable default and the meticulous steps involved in filing an application. Our journey through case laws revealed the judiciary's critical role in interpreting and refining the application of Section 10, shaping the insolvency landscape. We've also armed corporate debtors with strategic insights to navigate the insolvency process, emphasizing the significance of each procedural step and the importance of a robust application. Let's not forget the role of the adjudicating authority, a beacon that ensures the integrity of the process, and the imperative of the moratorium's strategic use. Reflect on these insights as you consider the expansive and nuanced domain of corporate insolvency. Knowledge and preparation are your steadfast allies. As we reach the end of our comprehensive session on Section 10, we extend our deepest gratitude for your attention and engagement. If this detailed walkthrough has enlightened your understanding of the insolvency process, we invite you to join our community by hitting the like button, subscribing to our channel, and sharing this video. Your interaction is more than just digital support, it's a ripple effect, carrying clarity and empowerment through the waves of legal complexities. We're here to unravel the intricacies of the law, making it accessible and actionable. By sharing, you become an ally in this mission. Stay curious, stay informed, and continue to engage with the legal world around you. Thank you for choosing Legal Bar Chat, where law comes to life.